Today, we're going to have a look at some very early talking clocks, starting with this one by Mattel. But first, I wanted to mention that there were a number of talking clocks that came out in the 1970s, such as these. But these clocks only played pre-recorded sounds of the characters. They didn't actually speak the time. You still had to look at the clock face to see what time it was. So anyway, back to the Mattel product here. It's actually called the Mattelatime Talking Clock. <laughs> now, I think somebody decided to put this Champion Spark Plug sticker on here, as I'm pretty sure that didn't come from Mattel. But I did manage to find a picture online of what the box is supposed to look like. That little girl there is probably still alive today, although she'd have to be probably 60 years old at this point, and she'd probably be mad that her face was covered by a spark plug sticker. Oh well. And the back of the box here is pretty well ruined. It has a letter to parents on the back as their sales pitch for this product. Okay, let's open the box and have a look. Um, notice on the back, if I can get the camera to see it, it was manufactured in 1968. So this was a year before the first moon landing. And so the idea here is that you can rotate the minute hand, uh, which will also slowly move the hour hand. And uh, once you have the time set where you want, you can just twist this little dial and... There you go. Uh, let's try another one. So the Mattel time, while advertised as a talking clock, isn't really a clock at all because it doesn't actually keep the time. Now, it's not a far stretch to say that they had the technology to make it keep the time. All they would need to do is add some extra gears and mechanisms in there. But uh, that wasn't the intended uh, target for this product. Nevertheless, let's take it apart and see how it works inside. As you can see, it has a plastic record sort of similar to what you'd find in a CNC. Although one major difference is that this product has two tone arms, one here and another one over here. Now, the way this works is that one of the tone arms plays the intro and the hour. The other one plays the minute track. That way you can have different combinations of the two. In fact, you can see that when I rotate the dial, the gray tone arm relocates over and over again to 12 different tracks while well, the white tone arm moves very slowly. So obviously the gray tone arm plays the minutes and the white one plays the hours. And if you take a look at the record up close, and if I move the tone arm out of the way, you'll find two sections like this uh, where there are entry point grooves, but uh, notice there are only 12 of them. It doesn't seem like that would be enough. Well, I think the way this works is there are 12 tracks uh, which correlate to the 12 hours on the clock. And then the minutes are recorded in five minute intervals like this. So that's the most accuracy you get. I mean, for example, you'll never hear this clock say that the time is 5.23 or something like that. It's always going to round to the nearest five. And so I think these are on the same track, but the different tone arms play different parts of that track. Or possibly there are parallel tracks like this, where you have one track in a regular spiral, but then another track is in between. I'm not quite sure, but you get the idea. Um, there are also two speakers on this thing that rest up against the two tone arms to amplify the sound. In fact, when you listen to the recording, you can actually hear the hours being spoken over here on the left and the minutes over here on the right. Anyway, so that's talking clock technology from the 1960s. Now moving into the 1970s, uh, Techmoan recently did a video about a talking clock from that era made by Panasonic, and they used a magnetic disc, so in a way it's just the magnetic version of the Mattel talking clock. But I wanted to find some of the earliest digital talking clocks. So I have this talking clock made by Spartus Electronics. Now this was donated to me by Dong Hoon from South Korea, and uh, he actually found a box with several of these clocks in there, uh, which are essentially new old stock, never opened. And uh, we're not actually sure what time period this is from. It doesn't say anywhere on the packaging, but I'm thinking this is a late 1970s design, but uh, the only way we'll find out is to open the box. Now, the clear plastic cover here is very yellow looking, and I suspect this is just from age. It was probably completely clear at one point, um, anyway, I'm going to cut the tape here. Uh, this is actually pretty exciting, opening a brand new product from probably 40 years ago. I don't even know if it'll still work or anything. So after removing this yellow cover, I'm pretty sure it wasn't meant to be that color, especially when you look at the colors they've chosen for the box itself. In fact, it actually looks beautiful. Uh, I can imagine this sitting on a store shelf somewhere. Anyway, um, let's take the cardboard off, and uh, now we can remove the clock, and uh, here's the user's manual. Um, the first thing I did was look through to see if there was a date anywhere in the manual, but I couldn't find one. So I guess what we'll need to do now is take the plastic off here and um, then remove this screen decal. Oh, yeah. And now I'll just plug it in and hope it doesn't explode. <laughs> 
And uh, we're in luck. Um, it just sprang to life without any complaints. But does it talk? The time is 12 a.m. Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> okay, well, um, I guess I should actually set the time to the correct time. The, the controls are pretty intuitive. Um, I didn't even need to read the manual. The time is 6.49 p.m. Awesome. So um, I wanted to hear the alarm, and there are actually two alarms you can set, a his and a hers. <laughs> I'll go ahead and set one of them so we can uh, hear how it sounds. The alarm is set at 6.51 p.m. The time is 6.51 p.m. Excellent. Um, well, let's take it apart. And by the way, uh, you can see there is a battery compartment on the bottom, but I think this is only for the purpose of backup power in case of a blackout. In fact, many clocks of that era wouldn't even operate on the battery, but it would at least keep the time internally. And uh, by the way, I still haven't found any dates on this thing. Uh, anyway, as I dig further and further into this thing, uh, it's somewhat refreshing to see how it was manufactured. I don't see any of the ridiculous cost-cutting measures on this. Uh, this was a product that would have likely worked for decades and uh, is even somewhat repairable for many things that might go wrong with it. Now, what is uh, particularly interesting to me is that it has discrete integrated circuits here, uh, not just an epoxy blob somewhere. Now, in fact, looking at these chips here, uh, this one right here is one I recognize. This is the speech synthesizer chip, and it's the same one used in the original Speak and Spell from 1979. In fact, this chip was designed in the mid-1970s. All three of these chips are made by Texas Instruments, and I suspect the other two chips are a microcontroller and a ROM chip, but I'm not sure which one is which, but now uh, they do have date codes on them, and to my surprise, uh, one of them is made in 1984, and the other in 1985. Okay, so maybe this clock isn't quite as old as I thought, but uh, just because it has chips in it from 1985, does it necessarily mean that it wasn't designed and originally sold in like 1979 or 1980? Um, after all, the life cycle of products back in that time uh, was much longer than it is today. I mean, even the Commodore 64 was on the market for like 12 years or something like that. Uh, so this could have very well been on the market for several years, and this might have been one of the last ones that was produced. So now I want to take a look at an iconic clock from 1984. This is the Seiko Pyramid Talking Clock. I'm fortunate enough to have the original box on this one, too. Um, here's the manual uh, in a number of different languages, and here it is. I have to admit, this is one of the coolest looking alarm clocks I've ever seen. Now, as you can see, there's no visible screen when the clock is sitting upright. You have to turn it upside down to see the screen. Um, anyway, let's open the battery compartment up and put some batteries in this thing. It takes two AAA batteries. Uh, now I'll go ahead and set the time. And uh, this thing also keeps track of the date and the day of the week, which you can set with this little bar. But I'll tell you right now, it does not speak the date or the day of the week, only the time. Okay, uh, let's try it out. 4.58 p.m. The voice is not terribly clear. It's a very low fidelity, and on top of it, it has a Japanese accent. Oddly enough, um, it has a stopwatch, which you can only use from the bottom side of the clock. If you push the top button, it won't speak anything. It just stops the counter. Okay, so uh, let's at least hear what the alarm sounds like. Uh, so I've set the alarm for 5.01, and now we just wait. And I'm afraid that's it. Uh, pretty underwhelming, if you ask me. 4.58 p.m. And so, that's the Seiko Pyramid Clock. But uh, we should take this one apart too. Uh, unfortunately, I do have to cut this uh, little sticker. And uh, here we go. It's surprisingly bare inside, and you're about to see why I'm certain that the Spartus clock I showed earlier was from a much earlier time period. This clock here was made in 1984, and uh, as you can see, there's not much here other than an LCD screen and a small epoxy blob hidden right near the screen. Um, anyway, uh, let's take this plate out. Uh, actually, it turns out there are two plates, and yeah, uh, these are kind of heavy, and I think these serve only one purpose, which is to add weight to the clock. Um, otherwise, there's nothing at the top other than a speaker and a switch, and uh, clearly, you can see the sound does actually come out of these little vents at the top. And now, I want to show you another clock which has a similar design philosophy, the Radio Shack Vox Clock 2. 
And while not a pyramid, uh, I say it's similar because it has no screen on the top, uh, just a button and a speaker. You flip it over and you get the screen and the battery compartment on the bottom. The Vox Clock 2 can be seen here in the Radio Shack catalog for 1986, along with the Vox Watch, which we'll uh, look at later. Uh, Radio Shack had another talking clock in 1985, which is uh, this one with the screen on the front. And you can see it is new for 85, but it uh, doesn't seem to appear in the 86 catalog. And uh, believe it or not, I owned both the Vox Clock and the Vox Watch here back in 1986 when I was 11 years old. And um, this Vox Clock here is my original that I've had in my possession all of that time. And as a total side tangent, Radio Shack also made a weather radio that has a very similar appearance to the Vox Clock. Of course, this was designed to listen to NOAA weather stations, a topic for another time, perhaps. Anyway, uh, let's put some batteries in here. And unlike the Seiko, this one uses AA batteries. And now I'll set the time. And let's try it out. It's 5.13 p.m. This sounds a lot better than the Seiko clock. Uh, let's try the alarm. Alarm on. It's 5.14 p.m. Alarm. It's 5.14 p.m. Alarm, it's 5.14 p.m. Well, uh, there we go. I'm um, about to take this apart, but I wanted you to see something interesting. Even after you remove the batteries, the capacitors inside will keep the time going for about a minute. Anyway, um, here we go. Uh, so we get three epoxy blobs here on this one, and uh, one of them is probably a dedicated ROM, which explains why it has higher fidelity than the Seiko clock, and that the uh, speaker is larger and better quality overall than the Seiko clock. Um, so while it may not look as cool as the Seiko, it is certainly a better product in just about every way. And I've saved the best until last. <laughs> now this is not my original Vox watch. I managed to find this one on eBay. Uh, this also came out in 1986. And again, I had one of these at age 11. In fact, you can see it here on my wrist in this video of me uh, testing out a codec disc camera. Unfortunately, uh, this box is in terrible shape and uh, the watch is a bit scratched up. That's to be expected if it got worn regularly. I did get the manual here as well, but there's uh, not much in here that isn't obvious. So the first thing I needed to do is open the battery compartment and hope that the batteries are uh, either removed or at least not leaking. And here we are. Uh, I think I'm in luck. I don't see any leakage. So um, I ordered on Amazon a pack of 10 for around $17. And I thought that sounded about right. But when I got the package in, I realized I had actually ordered 10 packs of six for a total of 60 batteries. I have no idea what I'm going to do with all of these. Oh, neat. Uh, they rotate like a little carousel. Anyway, so I'm putting uh, in these batteries and I'm hoping it's gonna work. Uh, let's try it out. Okay, it works. And uh, after setting the time, let's try it again. I always liked the little sound it made uh, when turning on or off the hourly chime. <laughs> it was like having a little sound effects generator on my wrist. It also has a stopwatch, and unlike the Seiko clock, this one will announce the time elapsed. Four second elapsed. Seven second elapsed. And now I'm going to set the alarm for a minute ahead of time. I want you to hear the little tune it plays. Attention please, it's now 6.45 p.m. Okay, now I've saved the best until last. I discovered when I was 11 that if you timed it just right, you could get it to say interesting things, such as uh, when it was 6 o'clock, you could make it say this. So an interesting piece of trivia is, you know, the word sick had a very different meaning back in the 1980s. It wasn't until the early 2000s until it became a popularized uh, slang term for something that is positive. <laughs> but anyway, the next one is pure gold. If the time starts with a five, you can make it say this. And now you can only imagine the laughs that me and my friends got out of that when we were 11 years old. <laughs> Now, I'd also like to mention again that uh, back during the mid-1980s, uh, Radio Shack really had some cool products, stuff that just nobody else had. And these two products here 
are a perfect example of that. You just couldn't get anything like this anywhere else. But anyway, uh, that about wraps it up for this episode. As always, thanks for watching. Thank you.